The Institute was founded by the U.S. Congress to contribute to the prevention, resolution, and management of international conflicts. Conflicts. I am Ginny Bouvier, Senior Advisor for Latin America Programs here at the USIP and the founder of the Colombian Peace Forum. Translation in English available on the headphones, so anyone that needs the headphones, hopefully you have them. We have thank you to the two translators, Marta y Marta, um, who will be accompanying us today. Uh, we will do the event, webcast the event in Spanish. Um, it will be available in English in a few days, but, but currently it will be live in Spanish. El Foro Sobre la Paz. The Colombia Peace Forum is a series of policy discussions sponsored by the USIP to support a peaceful resolution to one of the world's longest running internal armed conflicts. For today's forum, we have assembled a panel of experts to discuss how a peace accord might be implemented on the ground. It is known that with the signing of a peace accord, this does not mean that it translates into President of FEDAMPER in Colombia. On the other hand, Marino Cordova for the Afro Colombian Peace Council, COMPA, and ex president and founder of the Association of Displaced Afro Colombians. On my left, Diego Bautista, advisor for territorial peace and post conflict institutional architecture, Office of the High Commissioner for Peace of the President of the Republic of Colombia. Unfortunately, two of our panelists, Adela Aguirre, Ombudswoman of Pasto from the state of Nariño, and a representative from Penud, from Meta, was unable to be here, from the UNDP, were unable to be here. Before beginning, I would like to request our people joining us in the audience to introduce themselves with their name and last name so that our panelists are aware of who, are, who they are meeting with. The interpreter is unable to hear. If there is no microphone, the interpreter is unable to hear. The interpreter is unable to hear. There's no microphone. The interpreter is unable to hear. The interpreter apologizes, but they are, we are not able to hear without the use of a mic. Hola. <laughs> Así está. Sarah Cobb, estoy una. Sarah Cobb, I'm a teacher at George Mason University. Camilo Fonseca, from the National Federation of Ombudsmen. Jesse Wills, dot TAI. Soy Miranda Carmen. Miriam del Carmen, a Georgetown student. Germán Hilares from Georgetown University. El Jaira Rodríguez, American Red Cross. The interpreter is unable to hear. Claire Bucas. Claire Bucas, Comanix International. Don Sabo with Comanix International. Luciana Nevada, Comanix International. Bad Noise Kimonix, Diana Montalegre, George Washington University student, Eric Raymond, student at Jobs, John Hopkins University. Carolina Gomez, George Washington University student, and I also work for the Democratic International Institute. Thomas Jenskin, the 
Hi, Allison Muhlenbeck from the Institute for Inclusive Security. Jimena Sanchez from the Washington office on Latin America. Joel Ortiz, representando a la Embajada. Joel Ortiz, representing the National Embassy and Activists for Peace. Uh, Robert Williamson, also a visitor. Robert Wood. Global Embassy of Activists for Peace. Estela, Activists for Peace. World Embassy Activists for Peace. Lisa Lundgren with the project, Legality Project. Walker at Chucky Consulting. Alex Reza. Alex Reza. OAS. Bueno, les quiero dar la I would like to welcome all of you as well as those who are joining us virtually. I would also like to specifically thank my assistant, Maria Antonia Montes. Without her, we would not be able to hold this event. I also want to thank the USIP team that has fully supported us. For those who are tweeting, our hashtag is hashtag Columbia Peace Forum. As we meet in Washington today, the peace delegations of the FARC and the Colombian government have just completed their 34th round of talks in Havana. During the most recent session, the parties have been focusing in parallel tracks on the issue of victims and on ending the conflict. Progress at the table has been steady, and in recent months, a number of developments are worth noting. A series of measures agreed on by the parties to help reduce the intensity of the conflict. In recognition of the advances at the table and the success of the unilateral ceasefire declared in December of 2014 by the FARC, on March 10th, President Juan Manuel Santos announced that the army would temporarily cease bombing FARC camps. On March 7th, the FARC and the Colombian government announced a historic agreement to demine areas that have been particularly affected by land landmines. During the last round of talks, the parties agreed that the demining project will include the participation of the FARC and the Colombian military and will begin in selected regions of Antioquia and Meta, two of the areas most severely affected by landmines. In February, the FARC announced that they would no longer recruit those under 17. Other important developments in past week include the naming by the Secretary of State John Kerry of a U.S. Special Envoy for Peace, Bernie Aronson. The presentation in February of the report of the Historical Commission on the Conflict and its Victims, meetings in Havana of the Technical Subcommission on Ending the Conflict, which has brought together face-to-face -to -face six active-duty Colombian military officers with the FARC military leadership. The visits to the peace table of three delegations of gender experts from the women's and LGBTI organizations at the invitation of the subcommission on gender. El apoyo al Support for the priest process back in Colombia appears to be on the rise, with the latest polling data by Invermer Gallup indicating that some 72% of those surveyed support the government's decision to initiate negotiations with the FARC. This represents an increase of 10 percentage points from earlier in the year and may reflect a growing effort by the government's team to take a more aggressive stance 
in defense of the process inside Colombia, where skepticism of the process has been high. As talks continue in Havana, however, many are beginning to think ahead to the implications of an agreement back home. Sergio Jaramillo, the government's High Commissioner of Peace, has called for building Paz Territorial, or peace from the ground up. This idea is meant to engage regional institutions, local authorities, and diverse social sectors and communities in translating an eventual peace accord into practice. USIP has been engaged for the last decade in working to strengthen and develop the capacity of civil society to be able to contribute to peace building in the regions. In this regard, we are currently supporting projects and processes whose participants are potential allies in the development of Paz Territorial, or Peace from the Ground Up. These include groups like the Citizens Commission for Peace and Reconciliation, which have created a model for a multi-sectorial process to spearhead discussions on peace and reconciliation in eight departments of the North Atlantic coast and in Arauca. This process is now expanding to Antioquia and Nariño. We are supporting Planeta Paz to generate and create proposals and agendas, peace agendas put together by different regions in the country within the conflict, within the armed conflict and the political situation and UN. And with a process that in the future will include ELN and EPL. This work, this systematic labor is trying to align common ideas and common threads within the popular agenda that contribute to building the bridges between peace and negotiations. USIP has participated in a consortium of universities and social organizations that are currently working on a project called El Dia Después or The Day After and have facilitated dialogues in inter-ethnic dialogues and intersectorial dialogues in Popayán and is hoping to have other get-togethers such as this in other areas of the country. We have been working with women mediators in 11 departments in Colombia. Paz Territorial is still undefined. Who is going to direct it and organize it? How can territorial peace be developed in a way that challenges the historic exclusions of large portions of the Colombian population? Afro-Colombians, indigenous women, youth, peasants, how will it build on existing efforts? How can this be done in a way that is transformative and that creates new relationships between Bogota and the regions? And finally, what is the potential role of the international community? Today's meeting on Paz Territorial will look at these questions and at some of the challenges and opportunities presented by the peace process. And now, let us turn to our other panelists to address these questions. We begin with Andres Santa Maria Garrido, President of the National Federation of Ombudspersons, who will talk about the role of the Ombudsman in the construction of Paz Territorial. Thank you very much, Andres. Good afternoon. First, I would like to thank USIP and Virginia for the invitation and for being able to join you and all of you for coming. First, I'm an ombudsman in Cali. The initial question, what do we understand by ombudsman and ombudsman in Colombia? Next, an omb the ombudsperson is a local institution guided by the Paris principles, very similar to the different way that ombudsmen are called and their basic activity is to defend and promote human rights. But outside of that, and in addition to these roles and to this great responsibility, we have very specific responsibilities, such as 
opening or allowing more access to justice, allowing for more citizen participation, opening more citizen participation, and something that is very relevant at this time is making sure that we work hand in hand with the victims of armed conflict in Colombia. Specifically, in this first slide, we see some of the duties that we have as it pertains to human rights. But realistically, we have over 1,400 duties in Colombia for the ombudsmen in Colombia. Specifically regarding victims, ombudsmen in the countries are the intake for reparation. It is the ombuds persons jointly with the prosecutor's office and with the public defender's office that need to, uh, to accept statements. These statements are the ones that will open the door for the Colombian government to either provide reparations for to provide reparations for the victims of armed conflict. 87% of the total of all the statements or affidavits by victims of the armed conflict in Colombia are accepted by the municipal ombudsmen. However, the ombudsmen, different from the attorney general's office, have a different geographic space. In other words, they are very municipal. There is 1,100 of them. In other words, each municipality in the country has an institution called the municipal ombudsman. Just to give you some specific numbers, we have been able to identify 100,000 cases regarding human rights. And as I was saying earlier, 87% of the statements from victims of armed conflict were received at the municipal ombudsman's offices. But this is not only the entryway for the victims to eventually enter into reparations by the government, but also they become the entity that monitors and that goes with the victim hand by hand by identifying victims in different regions in the country. Additionally, the ombudsman takes on a role of technical participation at the um, victim's desks at, since the law of vi victims and redistribution of land has a very specific has something very specific regarding reparations and that is where all the different organizations of the victims are represented and at this intake table we will identify weaknesses as far as attention that is being sought and public policy vis-a-vis -vis the victims of armed conflict by providing this technical assistance we are able to have these participation tables for victims to actually be able to participate. That the comments that the victims make are actually heard and are actually taken into account by the local authorities, such as the municipal mayors. I already explained this slide. Out of the total registered victims in Colombia, 7 million, 80% were given, 80% of them gave their statements at an ombudsman's office. I have this additional data here so that you could understand where most of the victims come from in the country. And you can see that the victims are basically in the regions, in the different departments and municipalities ar around the country. When the victim's law actually materializes and is passed, then there is an agreement made that we have to improve the victim situation at the national level. In other words, there are more resources that are being made available by different institutions of the government and, of course, by the national government through its victim's unit. 
specifically in the municipalities, the strengthening did not exist. The strengthening process didn't exist, although they were a strategic ally for the improvement and for going hand in hand with working with the victims of armed conflict. The budget for a municipal ombudsman's office is $30,000 a year. $30,000 a year, and within those resources, most of them are to pay the ombudsman's salaries the resources needed for the call for these participation tables. To send the statements to the capital in Bogota, that money was never appropriated. The resources for being able to host the victims in their offices or um, have different intake offices, those resources were never allocated. So we have many offices that are very limited, that are very small so that um, they are able to provide this type of intake. In intake. We have been in proving, we are going through a process of improvement and to raise awareness as by the authorities and the government as well as international communities. In the international community process, this idea of improvement and strengthening, institutional strengthening, came from Bogota to the regions and not the other way, not from the regions towards Bogota. As a consequence, up until about two years ago, we began a new phase working hand in hand with Comonix and USAID for a strengthening process that would begin by providing the necessary equipment, like computer equipment, so that we were able to send this information, uh, or so that we were able to change the way that we were receiving victims. So we started by the basics, for example, offering computers so that you could take statements online, have um, chairs available so that the victims had somewhere to sit, and frankly, to improve the conditions of the local institution or the local office. One of the basic elements, which is the main reason of why we're here, and the discourse that we have been giving in different places, is that if we want to concentrate on reducing human rights violations in our country, then we must improve our local structure. We, co the conflict does not occur from the capital. It occurs in the regions and in the municipalities. The presence of armed conflict and the generators, the generators of human rights violations as part of the relationship with the state and all those matters dealing with education and with health need a local institution to be able to promote a local response. That's why we continuously insist on following the st local strengthening model so that we can prevent as an additional contribution to assist in the inst local institutions that already are working. For over a hundred years, we have had these types of institutions, but it's never been um, centralized within the internet. It's never gone hand in hand with the international community, nor has it truly respected the promotion of human rights within the Colombian government. In addition, we believe that not only from the victim awareness point of view, but also from the post-conflict situation, we have seen the demobilization go on in different countries in Central America. And there is a tendency of an increase in the violations of human rights, of um, domestic violence, violence towards women and children. We have seen this in other countries in Central America. Therefore, we should reflect upon this information and make sure that we have capacity building at the local level to promote the safeguard of human rights. 
we have become the only place of physical presence in municipalities, whether there are or are not people who carry arms in that area. We have seen a change in the focus that the government, Colombian government has given with the National Development Plan when it decides on concentrating on Paz Territorial. And the national government has stated that there are certain important principles. The principle of participation, territorial differentiation, and to protect and guarantee rights. And how is this included in the National Development Plan? It should be materialized through human rights and a culture of peace, protection of victims and allowing them for participation as a citizen, and to assist in demobilization. That is where we find ourselves now. That is where we have a specific role that is fundamental. When discussing victims, we are the point of access. We are their force point of entry for possible reparations. And we will be there throughout the whole process. But not only at this very beginning stages where reparations are opened, but reparations do not come only from the state. Victims have to re return to society because they are changing into a different type of development, into a more urban development, as most of them has been displaced and they come from a more rural environment to a more urban environment. And the economic model in the rural region is different than that in the urban. They go from self sustainment to having to purchase everything, water and food, and then all of a sudden they have to follow what is going on in that urban area and to be able to give a voice to the victims so that they can see how things are different in the rural versus the urban. In Cali, where I'm from, there's 158,000 victims of armed conflict. I want to give you a specific example. Most of the homicides in a city that has about 2,000 homicides a year, most of them are done by minors. So what do we see as far as juvenile delinquency? We find that many of their parents or grandparents were victims of armed conflict. So the lack of a public policy that truly reincorporates them into society and in an economic model that changes them from a rural system to an urban system has generated greater poverty and has actually made the urban violent structures a place where they turn. As far as citizen participation is concerned, we make it possible for citizens to be able to express their needs. Um, we are able to see where they are protected under the Constitution and give them access to justice. We also intervene um, in order to have resources made available for the communities. We have it um, through a specific fund that if there is a specific judicial process, a certain right may be recognized and we may be able to allocate some funds. As far as our presence in the municipality, we are there for monitoring. And when the early alert system was established, specifically um, through USAID, the main reporters for early Los alert municipales alert son dinamizadores a partir de are people who take into the entire context of their municipality. Yeah. Conocen los actores de violencia de su comunidad. Know the people who instill violence in their community and they understand the personality of their community. Sucede o lo que puede suceder en situaciones de vulneración de derechos humanos o en situaciones de infracciones al DH. Partiendo de un elemento que yo creo que es fundamental, la situación de violencia en Colombia no es homogénea, es heterogénea, tiene diversidades. Es heterogénea, es manifestada de en diferentes regiones. Las regiones manifestaciones pueden ser especificadas, por ejemplo, por ejemplo, por ejemplo, por ejemplo, por ejemplo, that that analysis that each ombudsman can provide allows us 
to have more information as to why these rights may or may be violated. I would like to reiterate that the main thing that I wanted to show you was that the ombudsmen, although they are invisible before the international community and before Colombian citizens, actually provide for a very important service. And when we make this exercise regarding what's going on regionally, we have to make sure that everything begins in the region. The ombudsmen are not the ones who are going to improve on the protection of human rights, but they are additional element that can contribute to the protection, promotion, and defense and monitoring of human rights. So we would like to take this opportunity to invite everyone to a more peaceful process, a more truthful process in the long term for th the government of Colombia. We ratify our commitment to peace with the government of Colombia and with President Santos. We support the process between the national government and the ombudsman that this has been the only government that it has occurred in. And we would like to reiterate that we are only at the development stages. We are facing these different challenges, but we have to make sure that we look towards the future. Small examples such as not having a chair for a victim to sit on, or not having resources in order to be able to send a statement to the capital, to not have the computers that are necessary, but to be able to improve in Bogota or the central government, but not at the regional level, goes against what we are searching for when we are looking for peace from the ground up. I had a presentation, but I can see now that when I bring a presentation, I don't necessarily follow it and I just talk. So I just wanted to um, give, provide you some numbers and some additional data. Agradezco por, por este espacio. Eh. I'm very grateful for the time you've given me. Nonetheless, we've brought some information that we can give to you if any of you are interested in specific data that is in English. Dr. Camilo would be able to give it to you. Thank you very much. Again, thank you, Andres. We're going to request, if possible, to give us a copy of the PowerPoint so we can put it on our web page here at the Institute. Thank you. And now we're going to hear statements from Marino Cordova from the Afro-Colombian Peace Council and the National Association of Afro uh, Displaced Afro-Colombians. Marino. Dr. Virginia, thank you so much for inviting me here. It's certainly a pleasure to be here this afternoon with all of you, sharing some of our experiences with the movement of Afro-Colombian in this peace process. To begin, I'd like to make it very clear that Afro-Colombians that have come forward for the neg negotiations to come out of conflict in Colombia, perhaps one of the most affected groups in our country. And that's an important point to underline. To try to perhaps give my statements a little bit more organized, there are some things I would like to share with you. If I don't do that, then my speech will be perhaps too long. The reflections I would love to share with you this morning is based around a central issue. And that's con the cons construction of sustainable peace in Colombia, which has to be with an implementation of the agreements. In reality, these agreements are part of the Afro-Colombian groups, which have been the victims of this armed conflict, which has made them even more ex uh, excluded historically in our country and what we have suffered. There's a lot of reasons, basically, that I say this to you, and I'd like to mention for the moment two of the issues that are important. First of all, a sustainable peace has to have reparation for the victims. Afro-Colombians represent at least 30 percent of that whole universe of victims. Secondly, 
The second reason has directly to do with the subject matter that has been proposed by this forum. To construct peace from the regions directly, regions that are inhabited mainly by Afro Colombians are not only the ones that are most affected by this conflict, but they will continue to be the most strategic for developing our country. Unfortunately, and this is something that I have uh, stated again with these communities, these regions continue to have a high intensity of conflict, even though the peace dialogues are going on in Havana, the direct experience of our community in this particular area shows that the dynamic, the violence that we see, the dynamics of violence that might occur even post-conflict might be either more or at least the same intensity. Recognizing the actual role, the important role that has with incorporating constructions of peace for the Afro community, unfortunately, to the moment, has not become a reality throughout the process of the peace talks in Havana. What has basically led a group of, this has led to a group of Afro-Colombian groups that are very well known, that have done a tremendous amount of work with the people, and we've re realized the Afro-Colombian Council of Peace. Before getting in depth on this particular subject, the idea that I've begun to speak to you, let me very quickly give you a summary of the initiative itself and invite you so that all of you will support it from whatever institutions you represent and whatever personnel is there. We know that the systematic co commitment the solidarity that we've had with the Afro-Colombian communities from the very minute that the violence began to bring suffering to our people is very important. The agreements that we've reached so far from the perspective of Afro-Colombians, the ones, the three of the agenda, which so far have been put out to the public all for very relevant issues for the construction of regional peace. Nonetheless, the process that has already been carried out to construct or, and initiate these agreements and the content of them show the fact that there is not a sustainable perspective to the realities of the Afro-Colombian communities. Even though this is a critical evalu evaluation, which I'm going to go in depth. The organizations and communities that make up the compact, the, the Consejo or the Council of the African um, Colombians, go along with peace and the agreements that have been reached. However, particularly from the Afro-Colombian perspective, as the dialogues and peace dialogues continue, we are convinced that the government the convenience of the government and the FARC have, that they have to publicly recognize the needs to integrate the Afro-Colombian perspective into the process. But definitely we know that the possibility of reconstruction to create restitution and the protection of our rights in a post-conflict scenario is something where we're going to see the institutional processes social processes that are working where they're going to be able to implement these agreements. From the point of view of our community's participation, this dialogue process has been very indifferent to the Afro-Colombian groups. It's very important to state this because that has to be corrected. If at some of the sessions with the victims, the possibility was given that some Afro-Colombians were present there. At no point was that carried out. The conditions weren't mentioned so that the collective processes at the basis that bring together thousands of Afro-Colombian victims would be able to have access to provide their proposals and analysis. After the analysis, the content analysis in the three agreements, we'd have to state that as far as general terms, there is not enough recognition of the Afro-Colombian perspective. The mention made 
for our communities and our rights. It has, uh, they are obviously very important, but they're much too generalized and they're much too marginalized. If you compare it with the fact that the effects have been tremendous on our community, as the, well as the impact that different proposals will have for these agreements to con uh, for the construction of peace. To give you an example, let me talk about the reform for the Agricultural Committee, and that's an agreement which obviously has tremendously important effects for the construction of peace and therefore for our communities. It's true that the reform and development and participation of different communities are not completely incompatible with the concession of the development of our communities. In our communities, we have been historically constructing these, but we also know that in specific issues, such as the, the actual works of the different land grants, that in no case that has been agreed will affect the acquired rights by the indigenous communities and the Afro-descendants, as well as the rural individuals living in the rural areas. Another issue which I've already mentioned that's important, but perhaps it's just too general and it has marginalized us, is the fact that there's too much silence that the agreement itself has that basically leaves us in a very vulnerable position. There's also many conflicts that could arise from the implementation of these agreements if it's not explicit with a set of principles that are key for example, where our, where is our concession of territory included? From the collective perspective, it should be stated. Other appropriations, for example, of land, the danger that territories that according to the reform should go basically to the funds for different land grants. So. Let's keep in mind that outside these areas that we've already recognized collective properties, there are many communities, African uh, Colombian communities, that continue the process of looking recognition of their pro properties in these different territories that they have inhabited for since their ancestors have been there. Why the councils are not even mentioned as one of the authorities? who should participate throughout all of the process that brings about this agrarian reform. It's very necessary to have this recognition that's full for all of our authorities, an area of the Pacific in Colombia, which is more than six million hectares, more than half of the region. The emphasis of this reform in the zones that are reserves for the peasants it perhaps ignores this reality or seems to. The fact that we have to identify priorities in some of the zones, many of which will cross into our territory based on the criteria that is being stated without even mentioning the authorities, the, the armed conflict, the individuals participating has limited everything. It's also a vacuum that has to be improved. Apart from the agrarian reform, as far as other points of the agreements, referring specifically to our participation also, we need to set up the fact that we need to incorporate an Afro-Colombian perspective into the process. After giving you this very quick analysis, what I'd like to do, speaking about the agreements that we have already be reached, to mention why we've decided, and basically, th this is a job that I began half uh, to perhaps, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but I have a cold. <laughs> we actually have to bring the leaders together, the ones that represent the Afro-Colombian movement, the organizations that most represent us, to try to defend the proposals that are ours from the Afro-Colombian movement that we believe should be a part or should be incorporated or kept in mind at the table in Havana. What I'd like to show you here is uh, some of the issues that I saw while I was traveling yesterday, I was able to bring these points together. Here's a map which 
places us in Colombia and also in the reality of what the Afro-Colombian population is. On the map, you can see that the 2005 census states that Afro-Colombians are 3.4, 4.3 million. And that's a little bit different with another reality, which is way before, where it used to say that Afro-Colombians were 11.6 million. And this is a, a situation that I myself can't even understand what has happened or, with those two different numbers, which obviously the, t the two numbers make us think. Either the conflict has affected it so much so, or the population has moved, or they died, or the census was improperly carried out. Something has happened, and it's something that we don't ag agree with. The COMPAC, the National Council, is a proposal from the or leaders of the organizations that most represent the Afro-Colombian movement. And as I said before, what we're trying to get is to guarantee the political participation of our people and that the voice of the black Afro-Colombian people will be able, Palenqueros Raizal, will be able to be part of the peace process and there'll be attention will be paid to it. I think that all of you are witness to what's happening currently in the conversations in Havana. There is a subcommittee, for example, on gender issues. There's information that we have received that there's going to be a hearing to hear the indigenous community, but they haven't said a word about the Afro-Colombians. So in a sense, these organizations that are on this list here are part of the Afro-Colombian National Peace Council. The objective, the very basic objective for the council is the construction of proposals that are collective in nature within the organizing process. Starting from that point, what we would like to see is that those proposals be presented at the table, but at the same time it should be shared with our allies and also at the international level. The legitimacy of COMPA is based on the agreements that have already been made through the organizations that are part of the process. One of the principles that we seek to reach is to be the voice persons of the, those processes that we're working with in the Afro-Colombian movement. There's a lot of divergence. There's a lot of different situations that are a part of it. So that principle is very important and very basic. At the same time, we would like to see participation of other sectors that are not included, but that they should at least identify themselves with the work that we're trying to carry out. The structure and governance of the council, they have a, a national team, a technical team, and an international team as well. And they all will be supported in local and regional works with the leaders that will strengthen our organizations, the members of, of our group. There are some ideas, some uh, actions that I'd like to quickly mention as well. Regarding the territory, for example, one of the actions that we wish to take, our proposal is a respect for collective titles, for example, in the Pacific area, as well as the Atlantic coast. I had already mentioned that there are more than six million hectares that are collectively in the name of the Afro-Colombian groups. But at the same time, there are many conflicts and interests that affect negatively these Afro-Colombian areas. There's a lot of illicit crops, the traffic of cocaine in the Pacific area of Colombia. There are concessions to multinational companies that basically for mining, energy, uh, forests, many cultures, cattle, 
cattle raising, etc. All of this make it impossible to govern and to live together in our communities. As far as the issue of victims is concerned, humanitarian crisis and reparation, we have already taken steps forward on the process that what we really should try to do is to have a, an efficient, realistic public policy for the attention and reparation of Afro-Colombians that have been a victim of the armed conflict. Integral inclusion in the register of victims, this is a huge problem that we have in our country. Justice collection guarantees of no repetition of the things that happened and military government, etc., that caused this crisis in the Afro-Colombian community, guarantees that we will be receiving back with safety and dignity and security. Here you can see is that the, we've been affected. There's over 6 million forced displacements, individuals in Colombia, which I've already mentioned to you, 30% of which are the Afro-Colombian population. And this, in comparison to the census from 2005, shows us that more than half of our population has been affected. More than half has been affected by this conflict. The victims, displaced individuals, all of those are living in that particular world of violations of human rights. As far as territories and populations, leaders and organizations which are still under threat because they try to go forth with leadership and to be able to express their proposals. As far as paths with social justice, that's something that we also consider should be public policies for reparation and attention to the Afro-Colombian groups that are victims to be part of the register. The I think I'm repeating myself at this point. Oops. Yes, I believe I've already mentioned this before. As far as strengthening the organization's autonomy, participation, governance, here what we request support to the organizations to assign budgets necessary for new development, regulations, or participation issues from the previous consultation according to international norms, recognition and support to the National Peace Afro-Colombian Council to have a construction of a proposal that's collective for peace, as well as the special subscriptions for communities that are Afro-Colombian. I think many of you are witnesses of the problems that we have in our country. We have two individual mestizos that represent the Afro-Colombian, which is unbelievable, but that can only happen in my country. So here you can see that these organizations, the Consejo or the Council that is limited in its free exercise of autonomy because of economic models that gives license to multinational companies without any prior consultation by drug traffickers, guerrillas, paramilitaries, and illegal mining. Leaders and, and communities that are limited by the increase of the threats, homicides, systematic homicides, impunity, displacement, that is forced, forced disappearance, discrimination of natural resources, and the abuse that occurs. This is serious, sexual abuse and violence against women. This is a very difficult issue. Many of this is not even spoken. The agenda of Havana, they don't include the collective rights of the organizations or our groups. Another point here is the uh, identity factor, uh, racism and different points of view or, or focuses. And we propose that there has to be an integral work against racism and against racial discrimination informed consultations regarding economic development, public politicals that are real and effective to improve the lives for these communities in these regions. R structural racism that exists. And lastly, there are some recommendations that we would make trying to strengthen the recommendations, and I think this is also very important to share with you, and to increase the visibility of the Afro-Colombian in conflict, peace, and transition to the post-conflict 
and their recommendations to support politically so that COMPA will be able to participate or have real participation in the negotiations at Havana. To integrate COMPA in the dialogues regarding the programmation of funds in order to do everything necessary for post-conflict and credits and other subjects that are related and guarantee measures of security and protection for the leaders that are construct, uh, constructing these proposals for peace of territories and communities. I'd like to end by saying that one of the points that most has affected us, the most serious situation that we see today, is the constant amount of leaders of ours that have to constantly be moving in order to maintain their lives. The most serious issue is impunity, because there is no justice on these issues. And even more than impunity, there is no trust with whom they should talk to or present their problems. And there's no response from the institutions. The protection, national protection agencies haven't even responded to us. And instead of offering mechanisms day to day, the guarantees are less and less to guarantee the lives and the work of these leaders in the community. Thank you. Bueno, muchas gracias, Marino. Thank you very much. And if you could please leave us the PowerPoint so that we could upload it. We will now hear from Diego Bautista, the advisor for territorial peace and post-conflict institutional architecture. That's a long name of the Office of the High Commissioner of Peace and the Presidency of Colombia. Thank you very much, Virginia. First of all, I would like to thank the U.S. Institute for Peace in the United States for this long effort and ar their arduous work to find ideas in order to solve the conflict in Colombia and you, Ginny, specifically for all your cooperation and your exhaustive collaboration throughout this because the peace process in Colombia does need lots of different ideas as it is very complicated to build peace in Colombia nowadays. This is something that makes us more demanding when we face these challenges. F I want to highlight this first because there are some minimum standards that I believe Colombia will meet when they sign the end of the armed conflict. First, it will finish, it will terminate violence in Colombia as we have been a country that has many victims due to this violence. Something else is to no longer attack the social infrastructure and the economic infrastructure that helps in the, develop, the economic development of the country as all of us depend on that infrastructure. And third, there's this disjoinder in the community because there are different points of view when facing the conflict. There's lots of stigmatization going around because of what you think and also because how you see the conflict. And I think that these are minimum standards that we must meet. And if we are able to reach these minimum standards, then all the negotiation process or the peace talks will have been something positive. However, the infrastructure will go far beyond that. And the way the government sees it, we are trying to take advantage of the signing of this accord to make a change and to become current with all the needs that we need in our society. This peace process has been a peace process, an intermittent peace process. It began two years ago with exploration, which is different to what was occurring a year ago and to what is occurring now. In fact, what was occurring three months ago is different than what is happening now. And in fact, I would hope that in three more months, we have more positive news and we see how this peace process has gained strength. As you all know, the way that it has been designed, uh, this process in Havana, um, has had certain limits on the agenda. The rules of the game have been changed. And it's not by the government exclusively, but also by the Colombian community that has tried to 
continue adding to this process and making changes. So throughout the process, we have always learned, and that is why we have been able to strengthen it and be more optimistic as we look towards our future. We now find ourselves at a very important point, as the negotiating teams have stated. We are now facing very difficult matters, such as justice, how many years, how much jail time should you face versus, well, basically everything that we're facing because of this transitional justice. We also have the returning of weapons. This is something else that's very difficult. These peace talks are about to get even more difficult. But as Jeannie was mentioning earlier, the time limits that we are, we are proposing for these conversations and the uh, way that we are facing the process this time allows us to be more optimistic. How far are we for signing the accord? And that's anybody's guess. I believe that we're months away. This allows us to take advantage of this moment that we feel that we are making strides for readiness. The government feels that it is ready. We have um, a team for readiness for implementation of the accords and what we're studying what it's going to mean as far as resources, as far as actions, and how it's going to affect Colombian society as a whole. And for the next implementation process, the High Commissioner of Peace has shown that Paz Territorial, or Peace from the Grounds Up, is the way that we must implement this peace accord. And from this point of view, we are also trying to incorporate it, incorporate the best practices of what we've learned in other from other institutions throughout other peace processes in Colombia and at the international level. We have been able to work with different institutions in, in collaboration so that we learn from their best practices as well. We always hear about the positive ones like the M19 process that um, just recently was um, met the 25 years that we've had this M M19 accord and this was very successful as far as political terms are concerned. And nowadays they are participants in the Colombian government. Some of them are mayors, some of them are governors, some of them work for Congress, some are part of the um, newspaper elite in Colombia and they are very important political figures. But what occurred in the re at the regional level where these programs were successful shows us that we need to delve a little bit deeper, that we need to go further than um, appropriation or licenses or assistance for those groups who turn in their weapons. We need to go beyond a level of assistance because 25 years after the fact, we're seeing the same problems in the region. We still have the same gaps between urban and rural. We still lack public services in many of the same regions. The poverty indicators do not seem to have improved and in fact in some cases have worsened in these regions. So when taking into account what we consider a successful peace process, we need to define as a government what this idea of Paz Territorial is, the way the High Commissioner has proposed it. If our, p our objective is actually peace, which is the objective of this accord, we want to make sure that we protect the rights of all Colombians in every part of the country. And that is what our end goal is with this whole process. How do we do this? It's very important, and that is what we have to learn from past experiences. And what we have seen is that the only way to have stable peace and long-lasting peace is by transforming the region, transforming the way the citizens see our new peace arena that sees the region as a whole and sees that there has to be institutional changes and there has to be a cultural change and uh, always have the vision of peace. And that is what territorial peace is. It is ensuring the protection of rights from a regional perspective so that all regions are participating and all citizens are participating in this process. 
for these reasons, we have presented this as a joint peace process because that is specifically what it is. This is not going to be a process with public policy designed by some uh, politicians in Bogota or by some technical advisors. This has been our tradition of the past, but this time we will be part have we will incorporate more citizens. Las complejidades de la construcción de the government is unable to move forward on its own. It's going to need assistance from the private sector, from academia, from churches, from social organizations who have been peace building for many years. <laughs> they have been, found themselves in adverse, and this joint process has to be from the territories and understanding the uh, public populations of individuals that live in these different territories to understand that Marino and Andres have already mentioned some of the special and different situations that we find. This takes us to the very first stage of peace process, which is adjusting it so that it become institutionality. Our current institutional architecture is not one that functions well for peace building. And it doesn't because the central environment does not understand the differences in the regions and it has a homogeneous treatment to face any issues that may arise, for example, in Baudó or Chocó or in North Cauca or in South Nariño or South Bolívar. These are issues that each region has because of their specific situation, and they're not necessarily incorporated in all the public policy from Bogota. So there must be some specific changes there so that we move from a planning and budgeting stage and resource allocation stage from a specific territory to the territory as a community. That's not the way it is viewed now, and that is one of the things that must be changed for this idea of peace from the ground up. As far as institutions are concerned, many of you know here that there is much weakness in many of the institutions for compliance, specifically future compliance of the accords, of what is being established by the accords, for those who have been heavily touched by the conflict. There is also a very important agenda item, which is the implementation of the law of victims has already taught us certain things regarding the resources that we need, regarding the speed that we need to be able to respond to the, cons to the community. As far as land restoration, we also have to um, see how quickly we can react to that and how um, we can be supportive. When you go to a certain region, you say, you always hear, look, look, you implemented this from the capital, you signed off on this from the capital, but we have to implement it. And now you're doing the same thing from Havana, you sign off and we have to implement it. And we aren't given the additional resources or management tools to do so. This is something that we must face in this peace building process. And the idea of sharing between the regions and the capital. We have um, some departments like Antioquia, Santander, and Cundinamarca that are different from Arauca, Caquetá, and Putumayo who have a different population number. But as far as resources are concerned, they're treated equally. So when facing peace building, we have to study the current institutionality and see how we can improve upon it, kind of by a surgical method. We also need to be able that we define institutionality in order to implement any possible accord rising out of Havana. How are we going to do this? We have to understand what is going on right now. Right now we have a policy of consolidation. We are consolidating territories and there are different action plans that have been brought forth by the victims unit, by the agency, the Colombian Agency for Reinsertion, and there are some organizations that are working at the regional level for resolving the conflict. Now we have to define what the institutions will be for post-conflict or for peace building. 
And this also occurs because there are different levels of coordination and different tools that are available so that we may continue with the peace building process. Institutionality will also, the institution will also have to learn that we need to go work hand in hand with social organizations because of participation as we see that participation is one of the basic elements in peace building within this peace process from the grounds up. We do have a participation process currently, and we do have some specific tools, but this participation requires a change with the new stages that we will be facing. Participation is a basic element of accords. You can see that there are community assemblies, that there are development plans, regional development plans, uno por uno, explícito en los textos. And one by one, there are specific texts for the participation, and we must be able to implement them. But participation is also a transversal principle. It, it cross-cuts every region. On the one hand, we have to adjust the institution, but on the other hand, we also have to include a participation model that empowers the citizens to face these issues and to be more active than passive citizens. This is a different type of participation to what we currently have. It has to be a participation that creates change, that you are able to utilize the public resources in the municipalities, that you plan ahead and that you design policy. Nowadays, we see different um, ways where citizens are participating, but they are not having the necessary effect on public decisions. We have um, participation in Montes de Maria and El Cauca. Um, we have participation by Afro-Colombians. Some, um, like in Cauca, come from, or Nariño, come from the government directly. And there are different peace processes within the peace programs. So there are lots of participation models, but they still have a long way to go as far as influencing the design of public policy. And that is another challenge that we face when we look at participation. We also have to be able to move above and beyond this idea of revindication and actually becoming part of society once again. We must be able to show this participation, this participative democracy that exists in Colombia has to coexist with a challenging movement of participation. This is necessary, and I believe it is included in the Accords, and it'll be part of the very important political agenda with peace building. And there's a third element within peace building and Paz Territorial, which is intangible. But when we visited several regions last year, we went to many regions, dis um, had discussions with governors, with mayors, with civil society, where um, in these areas where we will probably begin the implementation, there is this intangible, and the intangible is distrust. In Colombia, almost around the whole country, in fact, in areas where the conflict wasn't as intense, there is a disjoinder in the social fabric, specifically in the, even more in the areas where conflict was very high. When local organizations discuss, uh, converse with the governments, the gov they don't trust each other, and then local governments don't trust the national government. The organizations themselves don't trust each other. As Mr. Marino was saying, within the same organizations, there is distrust. They are fractured. And that is a task that is not a minor task within the peace building process, because we can have development agendas. We can have action plans. We've learned a lot from our action plans, but actually implementing them makes these frictions that create this distrust be reduced. And that is another element that we have to really work on. For this reason, the government has began to state that just as there has been talks in Havana, and as we all hope, 
this will continue to be successful, at the moment of implementation, there should be talks on peace building that will organize the information that has emanated from the accords and the impact that it has on the regions because it will be different for each region and that it can identify any issues that are going to arise at the implementation point and that we can somehow respond to these in a more constructive manner when compared to the past. This is another one of the important tasks within peace building as far as Paz Territorial is concerned. Reconozca la diversidad del territorio the different diversities of territory, models of participation that really have the participation of the citizens in an appropriate manner and that be part of the influence and the trust that has to be built, which perhaps is the most difficult thing to do in peace building and that we see today based on the different individuals that are looking at the process skepticism, pessimism in some of the territories, and a series of concerns. We need to say that based on all of this, as a government, we have a lot to improve when we go to the levels of pedag ped pedagogy when they have to implement it in these urban areas of Colombia, etc. But there is something that's very concerning us in what's happening. And the fact of this mistrust, that's an obstacle to make us go even slower on these ag peace agendas, so what you need to do. Having said all of this, we're not naive either. Based on the incredible challenges that the, this peace building is going to hand us. On the 31st of October this year, we're going to have governor elections, mayors and elections on the 1st of January. Next year, in about 10 months or so, they will take that those new offices, new governors, new mayors for a period of four years. Now perhaps they'll be the first governors and mayors that are going to face all of this challenge of the post-conflict. Amongst all of these challenges, there are three that very clearly we can see. The first has to do with the implementation of all of these accords and everything to do with the post-conflict. And here, as some have been mentioned today, have to do with the victims themselves, has to do with restitution of their lands, that has to do with reincorporating them to their, their lives on an economic and civil level for the ex-combatants. And it has to do with the air, rural areas, the zones that really have low abilities of institutions or capacities. Those are the challenges that these new officials are going to have to face. In general, these areas, when they be, take over these offices in the 1st of January 2016. But there are other challenges, the traditional challenges, the ones that know that there's a tremendous problems in Colombia in certain regions and with certain populations in Colombia. Those that have to do with the access to public services, for example, in regions that are not the main parts of our municipalities. The Roads, for example, the third level roads so that can have a social economic impact in the areas, areas where there's no water available, where public health is not a right, areas where there's a tremendous lack of presence of the state and a lack of complying with everything that they have to do in order to bring about the post-conflict accords. And a third set of problems that are not least some already exist, but I'm sure they will be, some of them will become even larger in the future have to do with the conflicts that we are already seeing in our territory between mining, for example, the environment, between environment and agriculture, all of these series of conflicts that are emerging, the different levels of development between industry based on the peasants, the small producers of the country between populations that are Afro-Colombian, indigenous, everyone in the same territory, and the use of the territory. This will be all a source of lar tremendous conflicts. So this is to say that the challenges are enormous and that they're not going to be resolved from one day to the next. They're going to require not only development plan that's four years, but a longer agenda. And that's why this is something all of us have to work on for con constructing them. Territorial peace or this peace from the ground up is asking to be to, to analyze all of these problems territory by territory and to be able to bring all this together to, so that everyone is aware of all these challenges. Additionally, 
There are some subjects that I have to mention as well and that are structural in nature. They have to do with the structural issues that affect the territory, but sometimes don't really depend on it. First of all, safety, security. It's not going to be possible to set up an agenda for peace building without it. It is a requirement to be able to go ahead with an agenda for peace building. A mechanism, a participation, an office is not even legitimate, nor will it have any impact if we don't have everyone participating. Safety for the social leaders of our country which is also part of the Accords, safety for the politicians, for the individuals that make our policies, and safety in the rural areas, which is perhaps going to be one of the most important challenges which the government has already been moving forward, and they're thinking of how they're going to accomplish it. All of this, then, is on the table. When we talk about Central America, for example, when we look at all the different international processes that the problem of insecurity that goes after the agreement of accords. I don't know if it has to be that way necessarily, or perhaps we're learning in a different way and with the intelligence we get from our history is to try to correct these problems of something that is we know are going to happen with all of the different processes we've had throughout history. So this element of safety is important. Peace, as the president said, has to bring more peace. It can't possibly be that peace will bring less safety and security. It has to be more. It's necessary in order to construct peace. On the other hand, the subject of justice is very important. If we're talking about compliance and the guarantee of rights for all Colombians, justice has to improve. Today, for example, the things that have been happening, everyone's aware of it, that they have relevant issues that happen. The judicial process has to improve, have more access, be faster, guarantee the rights of citizens, that most of them will be reaffirmed with compliance with the accords that are being mentioned in Havana. The other point is the economic dynamics. So in order to sustain the peace, we require not only an effort for the first months of post-conflict and its implementation, but in reality, they have to be part of sustainable solutions. And this happens through the dynamic economics of territories that will make peace sustainable, that later on will have more success to reinsert these combatants to the re conciliation is necessary. The economic dynamics also have to be strong and faced with this conflicts, the different territories. We're going to have some discussions about territories and what are the challenges and what we have to do economically. Finally, a point which is per perhaps not minor, perhaps it's mid or long term, is the subject of political relations that agree certain decisions that are made that are politically decided in Colombia. It's one of the fears that we have based on the investments we're going to see for post-conflict world. And generally, to anything that has to do with political life in Colombia. We understand that we don't all, not only have to have territorial political reform. We understand that it's not enough when we look at the accords based on the st statutes for the opposition, etc. Other instruments that the accords are looking at. But also, the participation, as I mentioned before, has to be a determinant factor in how the change will occur. And that's an, an agenda we have to follow. There's many examples today in Colombia regarding how to carry out politics if, when you go to the communities that will not go through this sort of process of lobbying or, or favoritism, perhaps, that are occurring in Colombia. And that's another agenda that will have to be faced in the post-conflict time, security, justice, economic din dynamic in the territories, as well as a change of political customs. So these invest investments will have larger impact and also contribute to be able to reach peace. At this moment, as I said at the beginning, we are months away from signing the accords. And I like to say that, months away, because months is ambiguous, isn't it? It could be six months, it could be a year and a half. But nonetheless, we have seen through all of the recent events that we mentioned before, that Jeannie mentioned, that we're closer now than further away to reach the accords, although we're at a critical point. We're at a point where we're having to prepare 
starting to see everything that's being contemplated in the accords, the new land situations, institution, uh, this, doing away with the illicit crops, our participative nature. We don't want to have preconceived ideas. A dialogue has begun on all these different designs for organizational designs with the local authorities to be enriching the process. The restrictions that the accords give us that we can't implement until they're signed is also an opportunity so we can start designing things on zero day when it all begins when the implementation begins we're going to have to be ready but everything that's been con contemplated in the different points of the accord but also prepare the territories in everything ha that has to do with the peace building process in the first 12 months as we know from conflicts at an international level we have to have a rapid response plan we've been working on it already uh, with uh, using events that have happened in other countries that w it's incredibly important the first year after the peace building. So we're at that point of preparation. We're looking at the different regions. We're going there, talking to the authorities, talking with social organizations, incorporating a lot of the lessons learned from the victims, the women that have, as we said before, basically setting up peace building. And they have a lot of information to share from one region to the other and enriching the models that we're going to construct the peace. These are tremendous challenges, as you can imagine. They're monumental in nature. We are optimists nonetheless. And we think that if we are able to do this, do we bring all of the different society to this peace construction efforts, we have been able to s survive situations that have been barbarous in our country. I think if we've been able to live through that, we're also capable of peace building and to set up these scenarios so that they are viable and so peace will be viable in Colombia. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Diego. I think we're going to ask for questions. Unfortunately, we are at 4.30, which is the time that we had decided we were going to close the session. So if you need to leave, uh, go ahead. Don't. No problem, and if any of you want to continue for a further discussion, we can do that. I would like to comment first and to thank all the panelists for their presentations. I think that you have shown us that there is a great desire for peace in varied sectors of the government and of Colombian society. And I believe that you have showed us some of the challenges that everybody faces. First, from the institutional standpoint, from the ombudsman and the difficulties they face, they have a mandate to contribute, they have the desire to contribute, but they lack resources. They don't even have chairs for the victims when they are speaking to them. We have heard that Afro-Colombians are ready to participate, but they have not been incorporated in the peace process up until now. And the lack of incorporating or considering their points of view from the regions, specifically um, community councils, among others. And from Diego, we heard a very hopeful message that it is a process that is creating a transformation, kind of like a non-repetition guarantee. We must have many deep changes to Colombian society from the political point to the economic and a cultural transformation and a change in attitude for peace. He has spoken to us about a new institutionality, a new partic a model participation, a, a new participation model. And I can say that this lack of trust does exist among social sectors as well as the public sector and the private sector. And that is always a great challenge when a conflict is ending and there's a transformation towards peace. I think the distrust is perhaps the most difficult to face. 
so that is kind of a review of the presentations up to this point. But I would like to open the floor for any questions, if any of you have any specific questions. If you could please identify yourself and let us know what institution you're with. Alfredo Rodriguez with the IDB, but I'm here on a personal note. Welcome. Thank you very much. The interpreter is unable to hear. The speaker is off mic. A very good question. We are going to take several questions and then we will answer since we are running out of time. The speaker is off mic. The interpreter is unable to hear. And to be, as the colleagues, uh, as co our colleagues said, that they can present their own proposals. So I have the question, since you expressed this wonderful political will, and let me congratulate you for that, if you could at least now share one or two specific action items of how how is it that you are able to do this now to strengthen this inclusion? Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Hi, I'm Adam Isaac. I have a quick question regarding resources. If you think about all the commitments that you have, social inclusion, the victim registry for so many victims and in the accords, um, land reform, peaceful deployment. I mean, I mean, if we were just to write all these numbers out on a napkin and we were to say, okay, 
um, we are all going to, the government and donors are going to spend X amount of money. money. If we're talking of um, 15,000 people, we're talking about 150 billion dollars for a peace agreement. For Colombia, that would be resources that were similar to what the U.S. had to allocate after World War II, or perhaps even after September 11th. And maybe this is a question more for planning purposes, or even um, for the Ministry of Planning, or uh, perhaps even the Department of Treasury. But are you financially able to make a, commi a commitment such as that? I have a question. My name is Carolina Gomez from National Democratic Institute and a postgraduate student from George Washington. And my question is regarding the comments that Diego Mautista was saying regarding the importance of the economic dynamics and political customs regarding patronage or clientelism and others. Throughout the negotiations process in Havana, we have not heard hardly at all of private sector initiatives, what the private sector is going to contribute for the construction and implementation of peace talks for a peace in Colombia. Just more recently, we have heard regarding um, initiatives emanating from academia for peace building in Colombia. And I am specifically mentioning the consortium, which I believe comes from the University of Los Andes and Javeriana. And they are just now beginning to create groups to work on peace building. In fact, I even think that in Spain, they have began discussing an education initiative for those who have been demobilized. But we hear nothing from the private sector. So I ask myself, when will we begin to comment on this participation on the private sector? What does the government do um, in order to support this? And when does the government make a comment on this? Thank you. Uh, one more. Uh, this is a question um, more for Virginia, and it's what are the lessons learned that you see in Plan Colombia from it becoming a peace plan to becoming more of a military plan and how the new cooperation by the United States is addressing the peace process? Okay, I think that we have enough questions with this. Thank you very much for all the questions. Perhaps we won't be able to answer all of them. So I invite you to continue on with this conversation outside once we're done. I'm not sure if one of the panelists would like to address one of the questions. Um, I can making a huge effort and sacrificing my voice and my health. I would like to mention and taking into account your question, Fabiola. I think it goes along with what we have been presenting in our country. I go to the meetings of the National Security Council for Peace that the president presides over. And in that institution, the president has stated that we want the members of the National Peace Council to study the peace accords, which I think is very important. And I must state that while being here in Washington last year, for the presidential election or for the presidential elections where we feared that the proposal to continue on with the peace accords was going to be eliminated if Uribe's candidate were to win. I went directly to my community so that we could support not so much the president, but he was the only one who wanted to move forward with the peace accord, with the peace talks. And that is why we participated in the re-election campaign. 
and that is where our commitment is born. But when the president says it this way, which I think is also very important, I think that the government is allowing, and maybe it's because uh, it's a logical way for the talks to progress, or it's a negotiation tactic, or whatever, they are discussing a very important factor, which is organized civil society, that civil society may complete, may contribute, interpreter correction, to the peace process, not only by studying the process, but building the proposals for peace that will then be accepted by the people. There are two comments that I want to make here that are very important. We've considered the fact that since the abolition of slavery, with the, lay, the law that was passed, there was an indemnization of this, the individuals that bought the slaves, and the slaves continued to be slaves. In other words, uh, economic, they were a political economic benefit for those of those that kept us as slaves. When you come from that era to our times today, when we reach the 90s with the new Consti uh, constitutional Assembly, Afro-Colombians, saw in Colombia a very important mobilization and the fact that we were looking so that our, pro our proposals would be brought to this National Assembly by our members. And we had no representative there. In the National Assembly that set up the new constitution in 91, we had no spokesperson present. We were able to get Law 70, which came through Article 57, that, that the article, the transitional, would uh, come out with an alliance that was made with the indigenous community. community. There is a, a friend who's in jail in Colombia, I don't know why, but at the time he played a very important role. Francisco Roja Pire was the one who was a spokesperson for the Afro-Colombians and proposed during the assembly, when the assembly was almost at its end, for that artic uh, Article 55, which was then talked about as Law 70. Indiana. Esos dos momentos. Those moments are not something that the Afro-Colombian has lost, but the country has lost those opportunities. When they leave uh, this very important sector of their population marginalized, where they don't give them the, the means where they could bring in their advice and their words to the construction of the nation, it's a loss to the country. It's not just a loss for the Afro community. Those events are very important to be mentioned today. We're now at a third moment, as I've defined it, if in the Accords, in Havana, the proposals are not included for the Afro-Colombian community, as we see the country, as we see peace, the post-conflict era, etc., but our own true reality, if that doesn't become a part of them, then I believe those Accords obviously are going to lead the country in the future. Afro Colombians will continue to be excluded, to be beggars. We're going to continue to suffer for the discrimination, the institutional discrimination, because if you compare where we are historically in our country and the development that the population has had in those communities, all of the indicators show that all of the indexes are present for poverty, all of the ind indexes that affect a population. So I have stated during the National Peace Council that to do pedagogy for peace is important, but how can I talk about peace agreements or accords if my proposals are not included? There are situations that are very complicated. I'm not going to say that they're risky, but they are difficult to understand. The reserves, for example, for the peasants in the country, where will they be? Those different areas, I'm sure many will be set up in the Pacific area of Colombia, and there's still a debate regarding the, t the lands and whether they're going to be given to the black community or not. That's not clear. So from Washington and from Colombia, I've been working since last year so that Afro-Colombians will find themselves in the peace national 
Council. That's been my initiative, and it is part of it, and we're stri taking strides forward. We certainly hope to reach Havana not to become a barrier or to impede the process. We defend it, that we would like to have proposals included. We're asking ourselves today, for example, how is it possible that the government allows that in Havana there is a subcommittee for gender issues and none for ethnic groups to be able to debate their affairs, Afro, Colum uh, Colombians as well as indigenous communities. That's being excluded. That's something that we've seen and it's concerning. In that sense, I believe that, that there's a lot of things, but I believe that we are available. We want to go forward with dialogues with the government, dialogues even with the guerrilla. There's a lot of subjects that have to be debated. And let me finish with the following comment on the supposed subject of demobilizations of the guerrilla groups. If you look, not at the commanders, but if you look at the soldiers, the, the lower ranks in the Pacific area, they are all black. These individuals, upon being demobilized, where will they return? To those communities. So what we're going to find is there's going to be a confrontation between those creating the, the, the victims and the victims. So there's going to be more conflict in our areas. Who will resolve those issues? Leadership, the ability to be leaders in our community, our leaders on site will be able to take care of that problem. And I'm only mentioning that one subject, to be able to live together. Dr. Virginia has already said that we're going to need how our leaders will be able to receive some type of training, education on conflict resolution. So they at least they'll have the ability to be able to handle these types of situations and find a solution. When the state does it, by then it's done. It's all over. It's a very complex situation. So I wanted to mention that subject and the last subject regarding the convocation of private sectors in Colombia. The conflict became very strong in the rural sections because of the businessmen in the countries that gave their support to the paramilitary groups in the Pacific area of Colombia. We have that experience in our past. In the area of El Chocó, in, in municipality of Rio Sucio, after 96, 20 of December, when there was a military incursion that was supported by the military, the Brigada 17, Rito Alejo de Rio as a commander, the Afro-Colombian population left that area. And a company that's called Madera de Tarian is still there. And they were there throughout all of the time that the rest of that community was displaced. That company never left the area, using all of the resources at its disposal, the forest resources, natural resources that were available with protection from the government, for and these communities were displaced. So it's very important that the private sector in Colombia has to say what their role is going to be throughout this process. And as Adam said, the actual cost for reparation, redress is a cost that someone's going to have to take over. What is going to be the actual cost? I think that's something that all of us have to work on those issues. Thank you, Marino, Andres, and then Diego, and we will stop at 5 o'clock. The question that was asked by Alfredo, in our specific situation, we are a response that uh, historically, in its institutional response, that re is reflected from the beginning of regions and locals, municipalities and states that didn't have financial conditions that enabled it as well as political con conditions to be able to think that they're going to see an improvement for the local areas. So the first thing, perhaps to answer well, last question, and I think it's similar to what you asked Alfredo, is that there really has to be political will from the government to be able to strengthen and improve local conditions. Diego has already mentioned, and I think it's very important, that the mistakes 
the restitution of lands, the victims, all of that, they should con contribute to the second opportunity, uh, such an important phase after we reach accords, and that errors shouldn't be repeated. And one of those, obviously, is what we're talking about specifically. You're going to handle the victims of the armed conflict, but you have to do that. But we're not going to give you any budget without a penny. So I've been talking in this scenario, particularly to what affects us, because at this moment, we want to show this as a very important focal point to a hysteric historic uh, situation with the agreement. As you know, we are since with not just a floor somewhere, with no chairs, with situations that generate some negative images in front of the victims of the conflict. The obligation to respond to their needs are sort of judicial, and it's a psycho-judicial or psychosocial. In other words, we're all the ombudsmans are not psychologists, but we're all attorneys. Nonetheless, we've been able to face these situations and comply with what we have to do. It was very important for Colombia from the scenario that it came from. Historically, they had to recognize the conflict and they recognized the fact that they had victims. First, they recognized the victims before the international community and afterwards the constitutional court. And during Santos' presidency, they recognized it that there was an internal conflict, and that's very important. Nonetheless, without knowing all of that that was done, those errors that were committed, the basic errors that were committed, can cannot be or continued or continue. We, what are we doing? We're in the same conditions, the same weaknesses. There's technical weaknesses that still exist. There's been political appreciation and institutional appreciation, but what's happening is that the things that have been going on cannot continue towards the future with all of the components of the territory. We're only a part of that. We're not enough. And let me give you the same example of the demobilization of the AUC. It was a process. Perhaps it can generate a lot of debate because it's a post-conflict situation, but it does have impact. The impacts of to have this uh, on a local level is that it generated a, a, a du uh, du duplication of structures in some cities, for example. It generated the fact that we started to see different criminal organizations coming together from the demobilized individuals. They started not by having a rural control anymore, but an urban control. So it's important to have a strong local institution. One of the risks after post-conflict, the post-agreement accords, is that the demobilized individual will arm himself again. And we have to start from the point that we know that we have urban groups that are armed, that we want to come to talk to us, to make them part of the situation. The signature, for example, of the leaders of FARC is very important. But at the same time, we have to be aware that it's not the only violent or active structure. Perhaps it doesn't have an organizational structure that's very strong or with a national face, but we have to say that it exists. And there are structures that are there. They're illegals. They're part of the violence that affect the area and could become vacuums that will perhaps suck in all these other groups. So it's important to have an element in the territory to prevent that from occurring. And secondly, as we said, victim, the victims have to be the, the principal role. The, the individual, the victim has to be, re, all of his rights have to be reestablished. And in order to do that, is not just an exclusive reparation structure or just an amount of money, but to be able to have jobs, to have housing, to have education, to be able to accede to all those. And additionally, something very important, starting from one specific element that has to be there, the victim doesn't go back to his original place, the life that he had before rurally, they're not going back to that. They're now in a local area, in a municipality, 
where there are violence, for example, by other groups that are generating the violence, that and those models have not been able to be incorporated like education, health, etc., in that municipality. And the individual in that area has to have institutional capacity to Im improve the situation for the victims and prevent that those demobilized individuals be able to start those criminal groups again, those gangs. And those are two important challenges. We are a very complementary element. We're not going to resolve the issues of improving the lives of these victims, for example, through our ombudsman's offices, or exclusively, we're not going to allow these people to become criminal gangs. But we can monitor, we can prevent. If we continue the weakness, the conditions of weakness that we have now, then all of that institutional local component is going to be affected. And the reason is the our autonomy, for example, allows us to evaluate whose responsibility it is to improve public policies, and that's the local mayors. The ombudsmen, the local ombudsmen, like ourselves, one of our functions is to monitor, to do follow-up, and to watch for the compliance of the mayors and the public officials within that local area. So that is extremely important. I think it's imp important that we have to talk about some elements. I think that it's a subject that is very important, budget. Being able to have access to a budget and for different regions to have access to budgets. And I don't necessarily think that it, this is just a regional matter. I think it is a national matter. The mistakes made at the region are not a consequence of the region. They are a consequence of the government structure that must be reformed. If there is patronage there, in a certain region, there's patronage in that certain region. But if you have this government saying that, well, since you have a problem in, in your region, then let's move it all to Bogota. Because the improvement process should actually be a reformation to change that at the local level. The local level is weaker and less adequate when it has a negative arena. But I think the first thing that has to be done is a political recognition. And I think that the National Development Plan has this in some capacity. And there are also more simple ways. This idea of having direct transfer to the municipality with larger resources being made available. For example, in my department, Valle del Cauca, Cauca, out of 10 points, if I want to call it that, for um, national taxes, we only get four sent back to us. In other words, Bogota keeps six of the resources and four come back to the department. And this happens with all departments that have national taxes, such as the um, tax on goods and services. And what has this made? This has made us make certain decisions within the region. And I'm giving this as an example, but not as um, definitely something that should be followed. But something as simple as this, as statements being able to take statements and being able to send the statement a format you're a victim here these are the facts and it was something that had to be done from a franchise point of view in other words there are certain scenarios that are so simple and that the fix is so easy that really you have to have a political will but this political will must also be part of a transformation i um, live in a city and i can give this as an example because we are a very important city within post-conflict we are um, close to the pacific area but we have an incapability to face the truth. And we can't face reality among conflict. If we can't face reality within the conflict, we will certainly not be able to face reality post-conflict. And I think that is something that's very important to clear up. As far as vulnerable groups are concerned, let me tell you that um, the local institution that is really present are the legal entities. There are problems within these legal entities, but that is the only way to work hand in hand with the victims. And lastly, to reiterate that 
when we discuss territorial weakness, although the international community has greatly supported the Colombian process, I believe that there has to be a deeper solution if the resources available for pre-improvement as far as prevention is um, concerned and as far as human rights are concerned, must we change the access from Bogota to the regions and have the access go from the regions to Bogota? Part of this strengthening, specifically when we discuss victims, was exclusively studying enlarging the national project at the capital without taking a look into the fact that the victims are in fact in the regions and that those improvements were not going to reach the regions and that legal entities shifted because there was a true imbalance that never studied the actual territories or regions. Thank you. And Diego will have our closing comments. Oh, I thought I wasn't going to have to answer this question about resources. Just to briefly respond to each of the questions first, as far as institutional strengthening, I think that it is a very important action item. And I agree with what Andres was saying. I think that as far as land development and peace from the ground up, the first one that must be held responsible is the central government that does not have an understanding of the region. Instead of relying on this idea that it's the regions that are weak or the regions that are corrupt, I think that we have to strengthen the institution at the central level to understand the region. But if this strengthening must also be different. In fact, all this peace building has to be different. We cannot have the same design for training that we have in Bogota that is non-centralized or that we have one that promotes from different organizations, you know, the classic, let's um, teach them how to program, how to budget, how to do follow up, and then the same thing over and over without incorporating additional management elements that are required by the peace building process. In other words, um, having this law this victim's law is not a PowerPoint presentation on the law. And in order to comply with it, all you have to do is go to this PowerPoint presentation. That is not the way it needs to be done. You have to have follow up with boots on the ground and be able to work hand in hand with the institutions in their regions. As far as Afro-Colombians and indigenous peoples and their lack of presence at the table, that has been a permanent concern. Different groups of civil society have wanted representation. And I think that during the participation process and the victims and the four events that we had in Colombia and the delegation that went to Havana was able to capture some of the diversity of the victim's perspective, the diversity in the country and their different interests. Perhaps this was not enough. What has been stated though is that the reconstruction of peace must be done in a joint manner. Havana is not going to solve all of the problems that the Colombian society faces. Um, it is limited to certain agendas. The Accords of Havana, for example, will not be an answer to crime, which is something that arises in every single forum. We will not be able to discuss crime. It's going to be a consequence of what is going on with the Accords, and they must be considered in preparedness, but it's not going to solve the crime issue. Also, we are not going to be able to build peace. You can't build peace in Havana. You can sign a document, you can sign an accord, but then the process of facing the challenges belongs to Colombians in Colombia. And yes, we will have this National Peace Council. And in fact, the Peace Council that is promote, that Marino is promoting here, and he has explained what it is, they are going to be extremely important at that stage. At that moment, nothing can be excluded. But um, let's Let's say that these are very complicated restrictions. We have still not culminated the process, and I am not the spokesperson here to be able to commit um, to say that all the communities will be represented, but that is something that definitely should be incorporated in the reconstruction process. Now, as far as resources, that is of great concern for us as well, specifically in our current situation where um, our economy is very complicated. 
um, taken into account everything that is being stated that is going to request investments. It's not just going to be a um, solution of signing on the dotted line and hugging each other and moving on. We have to have concrete economic solutions. And these solutions must be found. If we were able to find resources within armed conflict, we somehow have to be able to allocate resources for peace building. But in order to answer your question, we are working on these numbers. As you can understand, it is something very um, um, delicate to say, oh, this is how much it's going to cost because that has um, serious macroeconomic um, implications. But we are studying and looking into it to say this is how much it's going to cost us if we do nothing. This is how much it's going to cost us to have um, the action plans by such and such a date, etc. I can't tell you specifically how much it's going to cost, but I do need to let, but uh, yes, it is obvious that it is going to be costly. Now, as far as the private sector is concerned, they are being considered but as we can as I was saying earlier this is but a moment in time as I was saying earlier a year the process was under more, it was more confidential we couldn't discuss uh, readiness because it was too premature and it would take the wrong message to the table even as a negotiation strategy nowadays we have moved forward we are discussing preparedness and we um, had different plans like um, Reconciliación Colombia working directly with the private sector and there is a specific strategy for peace building that works hand in hand with the private sector not only in the traditional manner but also in this no negative effect from the private sector and from the private sector to be able to protect human rights as far as the establishment of protocols that already exist in the international system. It is of great concern. We do need the private sector. It must be tied to the peace building process. It will contribute resources. It will contribute to our um, economic the dynamics in our economy and it has to be seated there because they also are part of the conflict in the region or I I believe that there were no other questions for us the other question was for Ginny so you have the floor okay I apologize I just wanted to answer very briefly regarding the lessons learned um, on our the US policy towards Colombia although in, in Caguan I believe that we weren't betting on peace in fact the arrival of the plan Colombia money interrupted in a negative manner uh, peace process it interrupted a peace process that was already ongoing. Perhaps if all this money went directed to peace, we may have had a different solution. Nonetheless, I believe that this time around, we have more international support than before. There is an international recognition that a political solution of Colombia's situation would be a better resolution than a military solution. In fact, even if this could be quote unquote one militarily. And I think that this is the time to bet on peace. Colombia is one of the places that has the most hope around the world as far as war and armed conflict are concerned. And there is a real possibility of finding a diplomatic resolution in Colombia. I would like to thank all the panelists for joining us and for your comments, for all your work and for your dedication on peace and I would like to thank all of you for being here very patiently as we have gone well beyond our time. I wish you much luck in whatever it is that you're doing and in your work on peace in Colombia. Thank you very much.